How violent were the Anglo-Saxons? The short answer, not as much as you have been led to believe. British history is far more diverse than some people care to admit. Before the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons, Britain was inhabited by Celtic Britons. These people had been under the influence of the Roman world and were called Romano-Britons. The Roman British province was known as Britannia. The native Britons were a diverse group at the tail end of classical antiquity. The Celtics who thrived in the British Isles before the Anglo-Saxons traced their lineage to the Hallstatt culture in the Bronze Age. Then, the great Celtic migrations happened around 500 BCE and diversified the genetic pool in the British Isles. It is important to note that Stonehenge was not created by the Celts, but by tribes that came before them. The Celtic migration resulted in an admixture of different tribes. The Anglo-Saxons were one in a line of many tribes that inhabited the British lands. Even the Anglo-Saxons were not a single tribe, but an amalgamation of several tribes. In Ecclesiastical History, Bede writes that Anglo-Saxons were primarily a mixture of three major tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. According to written and archaeological evidence, the Angles came from an area called Anglia, a small peninsula in the German federal state of Schleswig-Holstein. Anglia is a part of the much larger Jutland Peninsula, most of which make up modern-day Denmark. The Saxons originated from Old Saxony, supposedly between the rivers Elbe, Eider, and Ems. Saxons were mentioned in historical records as early as the first century. Roman historian Tacitus lists different tribes, including the Angles, that all worshipped the same goddess. The third tribe Bede mentions in his work, the Jutes, originated from the Jutland Peninsula, the modern-day location of Denmark and parts of northern Germany. This location puts them neatly as contemporary neighbors to the Angles and the Saxons. Like those two tribes, the Jutes migrated to Britain during the 5th century. The idea that the Anglo-Saxons were more brutal and inhumane than any of their neighboring tribes is grounded in fiction. The Anglo-Saxons raided and fought wars against other tribes, including the Celts, but they settled down over time. The decision to settle in a single location is antithetical to warring cultures. Generally, violent and warlike factions were nomadic, like the Huns, or colonialists, like the Romans. Whereas the Vikings kept plundering and seafaring in search of better lands and opportunities, the Anglo-Saxons were happy to put down roots in the British Isles. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes all belonged to a significant Indo-European people group called the Germanic peoples. Like many early Indo-European cultures, the Germanic culture revolved around a polytheistic religion. However, different regions had different takes regarding their pantheons. Since the Roman world was being Christianized, they demonized the pagans as inhumane and barbaric. Some earlier historians hypothesized the Anglo-Saxons committed genocide and killed the native Britons before settling in their lands. However, modern archaeological research has shown this to be false. The Anglo-Saxons took most of the land relatively peacefully. Anglo-Saxons may have started their interactions in Britain as raiders and warriors. Still, as they continued to settle the island, their lifestyle did not differ too much from any other early medieval community. Since the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes were not sailors and raiders in continental Europe, they had to rely on other skills. They produced and provided food for their families, created and repaired weapons and armor, made clothing and shoes, spread the word of God to the laity, traded goods, built houses, and maintained order within their community. The earlier theory about the Anglo-Saxons pillaging Celtic Britons comes from De Exidio et Conquesto Britannia, a text by a Celtic monk named Gildas. According to Gildas, In the midst of the streets lay the tops of lofty towers tumbled to the ground, stones of high walls, holy altars, fragments of human bodies covered with livid clots of coagulated blood, looking as if they had been squeezed together in a press, and with no chance of being buried, save in the ruins of the houses or in the ravening bellies of wild beasts and birds. Intriguingly, the most direct evidence of Anglo-Saxon customs comes from their burials. The Anglo-Saxon burial differed from Christian and even Celtic burials, so it is easy to estimate their progression through the land chronologically. Throughout the years, archaeologists have unearthed many grave sites dating back to the 5th and 6th centuries. These sites include the Prittlewell Royal Tomb, Sutton Hoo, the Spong Hill Cemetery Site, and Fordcroft. 
Each of these sites offers researchers a wealth of artifacts that hint at the status of the buried individuals, their potential religious beliefs, their sex, and sometimes even the cause of death. At Spong Hill, we can find over 2,000 different burials, of which only 57 so far were found to be inhumations. The rest were all cremations, whose sheer number may suggest that several towns use this area for burials. The practice of cremation is usually linked to pre-Christian cultures, considering that the church did not allow this practice in those times. Before conversion, we can safely assume that early Anglo-Saxons had the habit of cremating their loved ones when they passed. Early pagan societies habitually buried their dead without burning their bodies. Knowing this further complicates dating graves at gravesites like the ones at Spong Hill. After all, the Angles and Saxons might have had different burial customs separately before migrating to the island. Luckily, there is a way to distinguish Christian inhumations from pagan ones. As England became more and more Christian, rulers and priests had more modest funerals. Even early Sumerians buried their dead with a wealth of material goods, as did Egyptians and even early European societies. While there are differences regarding their methods and the amount of material that was buried with the body, generally speaking, these cultures believed the person being buried took the objects with them to the afterlife. Anglo-Saxons held the same beliefs. A buried warrior might need swords, daggers, shields, and armor in the afterlife, but he might also need gold, food, and decent clothing. Sometimes the burial would be somewhat extravagant, such as the nobleman buried with his horse at Sutton Hoo. In Essex, a child's grave was exhumed with a dog buried next to it, suggesting that the animal was the child's pet. Most early Anglo-Saxon graves and cemeteries are so distinct that archaeological findings paint a relatively clear picture. The majority of early Anglo-Saxon evidence can be found along the eastern coast. These remains increased across the British Isles over time, showing that the gradual integration happened over a few centuries. It should also be noted that the Anglo-Saxons and other barbarians arrived shortly after the Romans began leaving Britain. The Romans were fond of hiring mercenaries to protect their eastern borders in exchange for land, so it is pretty likely that some tribes settled and merged peacefully with the locals. While there is evidence of burned villages and settlements, it is probably a sign of abandonment and decay. In 541, the bubonic plague appeared in Europe. Roman cities in Britain were abandoned, and existing structures were put to practical use. It is safe to say that Gildas's poetic rendering of violent horrors never came to pass. The British cities possibly went through a depopulation phase when the Anglo-Saxons arrived. Historians believe that Anglo-Saxons took over existing and, in some cases, declining Celtic kingdoms like Bamberg. Bamberg became the capital of Bernicia, which later merged with Deira to form Northumbria. Upon finding vacant seats at the top of the socio-political hierarchies, the Anglo-Saxons made themselves at home. In kingdoms where the top seat was not vacant, they took it by force. For the average worker in most regions, swapping a Roman landlord for an Anglo-Saxon one would not have meant much. Since the new tribes married the existing aristocrats or conquered them by force, they could steer the intellectual vessel of the society. For instance, modern English traces its roots to Anglo-Saxon languages instead of Celtic ones. Another bane of the Celtic civilizations was their fear or apathy of the written word. The Celts were not fond of writing and rarely wrote anything down. While the names of tribes in some rivers have survived in their original form, the Celtic language did not significantly influence Old English. In the case of modern English, the gap shrinks even more. The Celtic languages in modern English have very little in common, if at all. Different Germanic tribes gradually migrated into Britain over many years. They did not arrive in a horde and violently destroy Celtic settlements, although that is not to say that never happened. The Romans, who had left Britain in the hands of Germanic tribes after offering them land, were far more brutal. The same case can be made for eastern tribes like the Mongols or the Huns. As an example, the Roman civilization relied on military conquest, whereas the Anglo-Saxons were primarily farmers. The Anglo-Saxons may have started their interaction with Britain as raiders and warriors. Still, as they settled down, their lifestyle did not differ much from any other medieval community. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes had to produce and provide food for their families, create and repair weapons and armor, make clothing and shoes, spread the word of God to the laity, trade goods, build houses, and maintain order within their community. 
The Anglo-Saxon Ealdormen had political and judicial power. They would elect the new king, pass laws, judge potential criminals, call for wars, and enforce the laws. The priests provided spiritual support and spread the word of God. But there were other jobs in Anglo-Saxon England performed mainly by the poorest members of society, either churls or slaves. The most common occupation was that of a farmer. Other men would often go hunting and taking your 10-year-old son with you was not uncommon. Fishing was another way to get food, especially by the seaside. However, the most effective way of getting meat was to herd animals. Anglo-Saxons preferred beef, but they herded more than just cattle. They also took care of sheep, goats, and pigs. Poultry was raised and people kept flocks of chicken, geese, ducks, herons, plovers, and grouses. However, recent studies show that Anglo-Saxons were largely vegetarians. Metalworking was already a common practice throughout Europe, and Anglo-Saxon smiths were exceptional. Potters also had a lot of work to do, considering the wealth of pots, bowls, urns, and other dishes found in Anglo-Saxon graves. Women made cheese, brewed alcohol, baked bread, and milked cows. Men and some women performed as traveling actors, musicians, singers, and entertainers. The Anglo-Saxons led a hard life with occasional violence, hard work, and constant threats of death. They also played hard, as they were fond of drinking, dancing, and singing. Strange though it may seem, most Anglo-Saxons were having a good time. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Anglo-Saxons, check out our book, Anglo-Saxons, a captivating guide to the people who inhabited Great Britain from the early Middle Ages to the Norman conquest of England. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.